So welcome everybody to the second hour of Mind Shifters Radio, and today is Monday, January the 15th, 2024. And our call-in number is 563-999-3581. And when you press 1, that puts you in the queue to talk to us, and we would love to hear your comments and questions because that makes this your show. We'll give Michael just a moment to get dialed in, and um, we are going to start on our study of the Enlightenment today. And so looking forward to to that. And a lot of people have ordered books, but several people didn't order them until over the weekend. And today is a holiday, Martin Luther King. So the mail is not running. So I've got like eight Enlightenments packaged up to go in the mail first thing in the morning. So, um, But Michael said that you wouldn't need it for today, that the introduction and the... Uh, what he's going to talk about today that you would not need your book. So that'll be all right. And I hope everybody is staying warm and staying safe. We'll give Michael just a moment to dial in. And I'll direct you to the website, whyagain.org. Actually, um, I created a new page and I've, I haven't finished it yet. So it actually says on it, this page is under construction. <laughs> but the easiest way to find it is to go all the way down. The most recent pages, uh, it says our latest post, they're down at the very bottom. It shows eight of them. And so look up consciousness. And when you click on that, it will take you. I've got uh, several things out there about the conscious, the subconscious and the unconscious mind. Uh, some things about inherited patterns, which is out of the Why Again book the inner child, and uh, what do we pass on to the next generation? So it is still under construction, but I hope you go out there and visit it, and let me know if you have some ideas. And uh, I'm going to see if Michael is having a challenge getting on here. All right, just checking to, to refresh the switchboard just in case it's on my end that he's not showing up being out there. Welcome to the show. And there he is. So welcome, Michael. Are you with us? Thank you, dear heart, and welcome, everybody. Delighted that you're here to join us for this ongoing conversation about first-century Aramaic forgiveness and a deeper understanding of how these human forms called bodies work, how the, uh, the mind works, and you know, we're going to start, as Jeannie said, the Enlightenment book today, and it really is a, uh, a correct title for this body of work that comes out of the first century Aramaic language of Yeshua. If we have a comprehension of the structure that is laid out in that language. We can go light years beyond what most of the world is doing. Without it, there are all kinds of theories and no, 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 all sorts of things that people work toward to get what they want, or at least what they think they want, have their goals fulfilled. And then you come to the point where you realize it's not about your goals. So, interesting process that we're going through. Is uh, is Susan on, uh, Jeannie? Yes. Hey there, young lady. We watched that um, that piece on Carl Jung that you were talking about. Oh, yes. Very did. interesting. Yes, Wasn't yes, we that did. Wonderful. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, I would love to spend some time with that man as a, a 
a master, just to be in his energy field. Mm. And I wish I wish he'd had the distinction that love is not something we do to each other, but it's what we are. And that forgiveness was not about letting other people off the hook, but rather going inside of ourselves and alleviating, our, alleviating ourselves of the shadow that he so skillfully talks about. There are so many pieces of uh, of the puzzle that uh, Young put together. What a what a genius mind and being. Pretty sweet. So how are you today? Fine. Uh, not as not as cold as some of you are. Pennsylvania is about 17 degrees or something like that. I haven't looked since morning, so it might be warmer. I, I hear you're down to what? Didn't Jeannie say it was minus six or something? No, we're gonna we're gonna be at minus six uh, later later in the week or next week. They're calling for. Oh, okay. So, All right. No, we're probably we were. I w- I was out doing a couple of errands to get out, get free from the snow and the literally the the flakes are getting exponentially larger as the morning carries on. <laughs> so I got out and back yeah. in time, but it was in the in the low thirties at that point. But they're saying oh, we're I gonna see. get down to minus six well, sooner rather than later. Yeah. The thing about the Alan Watts, I love his voice, just to start. I love how he chuckles and his low voice. Right. And have, hearing him read Jung was, is wonderful in itself. The redeeming thing about what Carl Jung said is along the lines of what that priest Fenelon was saying Carl Jung was saying, none of us is without the shadow, the dark, gray, (laughs) bad stuff. But he said, if you can be aware of it, welcome it. Not welcome it. What did he say? He just said, be kind to yourself about it. it. Yeah, befriend it, embrace um, it, rather than run away from it. mm -hmm. Reminds me a lot of what Dr. Tim has been sharing. Uh, It's true. Dr. Tim has been telling me specifically, because whenever I do anything, there's always this element of, you know, guilt or shame or self-blame or thinking I'm less, all that stuff, which is just so tiresome, but I do it constantly. And the way you... You say you used to do it constantly? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Shut up, Michael. You're ready to say something. Go ahead and say it. No, 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 I'm I'm listening. (laughs) <laughs> I thought you caught some something that I said that you wanted to put right. <clears throat> no, I'm with you being right on track, embracing it all. You know, the what the bottom line of everything that uh, that Young was saying there was to me: bring love to the party. You know, yeah. if I can bring conscious, active, present love to this. Then this is going to heal. You know, I can look back 30 plus years ago in an intensive, and I'm trying to understand what what's the bottom line of healing. What's required? What does it take? And there'd been a really powerful shift in one person's field, like miraculous type shift in this intensive. Mm. And I'm sitting there going, well, why just them? Why not everybody? What what's going on here? What's the bottom line of healing? And and it was just really clear what I was told was, so two things have to happen. Something we've been hiding, the shadow, the unconscious, has to mm-hmm. come forward. Now, if that just comes forward, that can lead to crazy time. But when it comes forward in the presence of love, active present love, the actual presence of our human beingness, then mm. it's transformed instantly. And the mind is the only thing that carries all this, you know, there's something wrong with you. The, you know, basically the power person dynamic. I, I could, uh, in, in listening, I could easily hear him alluding to what we've presented as the power person dynamic and the behaviors related to the power person dynamic. And, and of course, the mm-hmm. healing of all of that. So, that's what we'd be here for. I had a 
question along all of these lines. It's taken <clears throat> many different approaches, including two podcasts uh, called We Can Do Hard Things that Tim Haynes has been recommending we listen to. So wonderful what those women say. In fact, they wrote themselves love letters that reminded me of Magda's grandfather letter, his, how she right. imagined or cathected or whatever the word is, it doesn't matter, they say. It doesn't matter whose voice it is. Is it yours? Is it God's? It doesn't matter. It's the voice of love, and so it's real. Yep. And, um, it reminded me of Magda's grandfather letter. These two women, Glennon Doyle and um, Abby, I don't remember Abby's last name, uh, wrote themselves these love letters, and they were like that. And um, all, all of these approaches seem to complement one another, whereas, and this isn't to blame or point fingers, it's my own work that I've been falling short of. I've done many worksheets on my situation with our guest here in the house, and I have felt as if I just keep banging up until... Uh, up on a stone wall, I don't get past a certain level of frustration and I'm right and all that garbage. Somehow, listening to these podcasts and having uh, and listening to Carl Jung, have him say, "Okay, we're all looking at it. We're all looking at the snakes in the pit, the darkest of the dark." And I've been doing a lot of that. He's saying, "Don't get nasty with yourself." They, Bring life to the party. Saying, yeah. <clears throat> it's all helped to cause a shift, even though I don't know if I've given up goals or what's happened, but something has loosened up about, and it may unloosen again. I don't know because I've gone in and out of this state of frustration many times, but right now I feel almost completely free of that frustration and willing to just say, let's see what happens. Nothing to The urgent. fruit of your work. Nobody's in a rush. What? That's the fruit of I your mean, work. It is, but you the know, each time you feel fruitful. <laughs> well, but, this, but you're eating the fruit now. So <laughs> it's not, it's not going to come in the bucket the way you want it, but notice that as you peel each layer of whatever the shadow, you, if we call it the shadow in Young's language, hostility or fear, mm -hmm. if you bring it to the presence of love, then another layer of it gets peeled away and another layer. It's like it's like turning down the volume on the noise each time you yeah. forgive. And that's where, you know, Yesha said, well, you probably have quite a few worksheets to do around that. And so let's yeah. do it. Right. And then if you get to a whole new level of vitality, if you're not finished with it, then a whole deeper, perhaps even more powerful level than ever is going to surface. And that will be the piece de resistance. That will be no, the piece I'll that will finish know. it. We'll be holding the space. Mm. All right. Well, appreciate you, and let's open up the Enlightenment book, and let's head in that direction. So it, with the, um, and, and again, the whole focus of enlightenment is to bring forward as accurately as we can in this language the first century meanings of the words of this man, Yeshua. One of the things he says is, my words are your perfect life. And he also tells us that the power of life and death is in our words. When you put those things together, you recognize that we can heal ourselves or we can kill ourselves via the use of words, which, of course, are reflections of frequencies that we engage in. If we go back to Einstein, Einstein starts out with this. On such things as matter, we have been all wrong. What we have heretofore called matter is energy. Energy whose vibrations have been so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses, there is no matter. We don't live in a material world. Reminder. 
We live in a world that is organized by the frequencies we engage in, and our words determine or reflect, I should say, the frequencies that we are engaging in. And here's a man who had reached a level where he had put together frequencies that enhanced life, overcame the disintegrative aspect of life that we call death, literally, and said, the things I do, you too can do. However, it's not happening in this Western world. People are in such confusion because we don't have access to his words. We have access to Greek ideas about his words, Greek projections about his words, but the actual frequency of the energy that fell from his lips, we've lost. And ideally, we'd probably all go to Aramaic school and learn Aramaic on the deepest level. But that's probably not practical in this culture, so we're going to do what's second best, and we're going to do the best we can to bring his words and his ideas forward in this English language. One, to utilize those words to assist and support in undoing, throwing out the language, the words, the frequencies that create death, and engaging in those frequencies that are life-enhancing. I've offered before my, my take on what life is, and if you hold a newborn child, you get really clear really fast that the newborn is love. That's the stuff we're made of. And everything that comes from that enhances life. And the best definition of life I've been able to come up with yet, at least for me, is that life is love flowing through a cell. You know, if we just have love but no form in which to, with which to express it, it's probably not going to come to awareness very well. So love flowing through a cell and the things that we do to inhibit that literally physiologically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, society-wise, they're the things that destroy us. Those frequencies that never belong, that are off base. Vladimir Lenin, probably responsible for more deaths than any human being in history, understood this. And he said, if you want to destroy a culture, you change the meaning of its words. Pretty brilliant. Yeshua says the power of life and death is in our words. Lenin says if you want to destroy a particular expression of humans, we call culture, then change the meaning of its words. Take its frequencies away. So what we're looking to do with this study, and I don't know how long it's going to take. You know, we might be finished with this in a month, and we might still be at it three years from now. I, I don't know how this is going to unfold, this work with the Enlightenment book. But... We want to particularly engage in words to describe the tool of removing frequencies that don't belong, and that brings us to a word that's really been abused and misused in our culture, just horrifically, and it's a word that is an archery term, and if you're on the archery range and you pulled back your bow and you aimed right on the target and you missed the bullseye, the scorekeeper would yell, sin, you're off the mark. I.e., positive feedback, take another shot. Now that word sin, think of it in terms of words. What kind of things have, have we had modeled for us and hooked up for us around the words word sin, what frequencies, what words go with that in this culture? Oh, it's evil, it's wicked, it's guilt, it's blame. 
all kinds of frequencies of degradation. So we want to lift that word up out of the mud, a la the Aramaic language. And so to recognize that all that word means, like let go of, forgive all of the baggage around that word, and recognize that all it means is it's a piece of positive feedback that tells us when we're off target. And it's an invitation to get back on target. Another word that ties closely to that is the word evil. And in the Aramaic, we get another major correction. It's an archery term. If you fired at the target and you missed the bullseye, it was sin. If you missed the target altogether, it was evil, like you're totally off target. That's all it means. So I'm going to invite everybody to consider throwing away all of the baggage, doing the work required to unhook all of the disintegrative frequencies that we've had hooked to the word sin and evil. Einstein, so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses, there is no matter. So if we hook frequencies of hate and fear and guilt and pain and drama and trauma to those words, they lose their usefulness, which to a great degree, coming from the Greek translations, that's what's happened. And they've lost their usefulness. People are, I mean, you, you can just watch people prickle when somebody uses the word sin, and yet adjust your aim is really all it means. It means be aware that the energy that you're engaging in isn't on target for you. So if we throw away the baggage, it's a wonderful word, a really useful, useful word. And yet so many people carry so many abusive frequencies from those who haven't done their work. And so if we're off target, it's going to be hard to have a life that's fulfilling. So if someone we trust can tell us that something is off target when we don't realize that we're off target, they've given us a gift. One of the powerful examples of the use of words comes at the beginning of each of the Beatitudes in the Aramaic language. If you've got the Enlightenment book or when you get it, I'd invite you to go to Matthew 5 and just render the words that are in Aramaic in the text with your own hand. Write it out. Don't look at, you know, the product of what's in there was two times around longhand writing out from the Aramaic comprehension of the words of the Beatitudes. But just take that first word, which the Greeks translate as blessed are they, which to me implies there's some sort of external thing that's going to come and bless us. But actually, that word in Aramaic, you'll see in the Enlightenment book, is tuvehun. Tuvehun is a three-part word. It speaks of unconscious dynamics. It speaks of a guidance system. And it speaks of whether or not that guidance system is active or inactive. So Tuvehun gives us the insight that there literally are neural structures in us that the Creator planted in us to guide us. And if they're active, you're going to be on target with everything. If they are inactive, this is all, this whole thought structure is all included in this word tubulin. If those neural structures, we could say brain cells, are inactive, the Beatitudes say, Beatitudes say that you who follow these instructions will come into conscious possession of and be able to use this latent guidance system. And what the guidance system is designed for 
is to make available thoughts and actions that will increase your happiness and well-being. What do you suppose would happen if we went out to... do an interview on the street and we gathered people and said if there was a thought structure that could bring you to happiness and fulfillment and well-being where do you suppose you would find it and I suspect most people would go off on some sort of a, a Grant about, you know, somewhere out there up in the clouds or somewhere some genius person or some holy person or, but where in our culture have we been told that that neural structure lies within us? The world is busy, you know, it, it's interesting. The word educate, educari, means to draw out it does not mean to put in. And yet you'd think when kids go to school that the objective is to fill those little minds with information as opposed to the objective is to activate the neural structure that is already within us designed by the creator to guide us to happiness and well-being. It's in every one of us. And if it's inactive, the whole set of the Beatitudes, and we're not going to talk about those today individually, but we actually there's a radio show we did back several months ago. There, I think we did three or four sessions where we went through the Beatitudes. But basically this word tuvion at, at the beginning of each of the Beatitudes says, hey, folks, there's a neural structure in you and here are the steps for activating it. I mean, who ever heard of such a thing? I certainly never heard of such a thing in church. I heard a lot about sin and guilt and fear and punishment and hell, but I never heard anybody say, God planted in you a nerve structure to guide your life to happiness and well-being, and here's how you get it rocking in you. Here's how you get it activated. How different... And I, I venture to say, would every life that's listening to these words right now, how different would each of our lives have been if from the very beginning someone was whispering in our ear, it's inside of you, there's actually a neural structure that will guide you perfectly. And then you look at the bizarreness of the Greek words that have been substituted there. And we'll just cover one beatitude because this is one of my favorite, aside from sin and its correction. It's one of my favorite corrections in the whole Aramaic language. Because we're told by the Greek translators, and you know, if, if Yeshua were to sit in most centers where they ostensibly are talking about his work today, he would say, that's all Greek to me. Because what the Greeks said is, you know, if we listen to Yeshua, he talks about this spirit within. And the Greek says what you're supposed to do is be poor in it in order to be fulfilled and happy. And the mistranslation of that word, and I'm going to go through a few different mistranslations to point out the importance of the Aramaic and to assist people to recognize the primacy of the Aramaic. Now, there'll be many people who will rage and scream. I mean, literally, I've had people rage at me. No, it was all done in Greek. They did it in Greek. Well, I don't know. If you know any Semitic peoples, Arabs, Jews, how many of them can you imagine if they had a mature, incredible, beautiful, way of life to offer, how many could imagine that Semitic person turning to the Greek and saying, tell you what, we've, we've gotten a written language, but why don't you write it down for us? You, you, you write it. You'll, you'll do a better job than we will. Can you imagine any Semitic person doing that? I mean, it's crazy on its face. 
So I'm just going to point out a few specific passages, and this is one of them, where the render rendition is just so ridiculous. that, And then when you see the correction, you go, oh, well, that makes sense. And you don't have to argue with the scholars about was it Greek or was it Aramaic. It's just simple that this is a ridiculous, I mean, Yeshua says, you know, you can deny me, but, but don't deny that one I'm here to connect you with, Ruka. Don't, don't do that. Make sure you stay connected. And yet, here the preachers are trying to get us to be poor in that very thing that Yeshua said is the one thing you need to stay connected with. So, in Aramaic, this first beatitude renders... You who have a home in Rucha, which is the eternal forces from God. If that's your home. Now, most people are pounded into their heads, and their home is in their heads. As though reason was the answer. And all reason does is give us resonance ties in with energy systems that are automatic. So the first proof for me of the primacy of the Aramaic over the Greek is rather than blessed are they who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> Yeshua, in essence, says be rich in spirit, but here we are. We're, we're telling people they're supposed to be poor in it. And that that's going to bring you some kind of blessing, where in Aramaic it says, God implanted in your mind neural structures with which to guide you when they are active. If they are inactive, you who follow these instructions will come into conscious possession of and be able to use this latent guidance system <clears throat> designed to make available thoughts and actions that will increase your happiness and well-being. You who have a home in the active or eternal forces from God, for yours is an heavenly estate. Now, I, I can't imagine how anybody could say, no, no, I want to stick with this poor thing, the Greeks. When they hear that, it's an invitation to, to get out of your head and live in this energy field. You know, we're told we live in an energy field. In it, we live, move, and have our being. And most people withdraw from it and get stuck in this little pea brain, this little nine-bit mind between their ears. And they think that's, you know, I mean, was it Dick Hart that said, I think, therefore I am? Well, Mr. Dick Hart, I doubt you did much thinking. I suspect what you did is you lived in a world of resonance, and you had a pretty bright mind. And you were able to put a lot of pieces together. But thinking, resonating information in brain cells, f firing information in brain cells that makes you look bright to others has got nothing to do with living as a human being. And as a human being, you are designed to live in the eternal forces in which you are steeped, in which you live, move, and have your being. So the first couple of pieces of the puzzle, and I would like to uh, just you know, put the invitation out there at any point where you have a thought, question if something you know uh, what I'm working toward doing is putting some building blocks in place and creating a foundation and then we'll build up to the first story second story we'll, so as the study unfolds we'll build and build and build and so if a foundation block is missing the foundation is not going to be very solid so if anything I'm saying doesn't make sense or is incomplete for you or you need some more brain cells for it or I need some more brain cells for it, please push one, ask your question. Put it right in wherever the conversation is going. And together we'll, over whatever time period we're working with this text,
put together the building. By the way, if you're listening and you weren't aware that we were going to do this study and you'd like to get a copy of the Enlightenment book, the latest printed copy is available. And you can go to our website and order it from our catalog. And if you do that, it's $25. And then the catalog or the program automatically adds $9 shipping. Or rather than doing that, if you go to our website, down toward the bottom of the page, there's a donate button. And if you hit that donate button, we can't make this adjustment in the catalog. But if you hit the donate button and you donate $26, the book's $25, one extra dollar, that takes care of what PayPal gets out of it. And we have PayPal as a gateway. You don't have to have PayPal to to purchase a book or to make a donation. You can use a credit card or your own PayPal or your bank, however you do it. But if you go to that donate button and donate $26, we'll pay the shipping. And we'll get it out to you quickly. And uh, the if you put in the, the payment, there's a place for notes. Put your name and your address and tell us it's for enlightenment. Then the next day, or, or in some cases that day, if it's early enough for that day, we'll get it in the mail to you and get it off to you as quickly as possible. So I hope that's making sense as our foundation point. Jeannie, any thoughts for you or anybody in the phone queue with a hand up? Anything happening in the chat room? We do have a hand up. I'm not sure if it's left over from Dr. Tim, but uh, 541, you are on the air. Okay, I think it's from Linda. Linda, you're Hello. on the air. How are you? Hey there, young lady. You? We're good. We're rocking. Okay, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, well, one question and a comment, um, if a comment is appropriate. Well, one thing is you mentioned the Aramaic understanding of Job when he was taught. It was something. It was a couple of days ago, but I never was able to get back in to ask you. Um, where, what Bible versions do you use um, for finding any of the Aramaic when it hasn't been translated from the Kabura the manuscript yet? Well, I've got several sources that I've gone to. Uh, the, my original uh, introduction to the Aramaic, which is about mm, 30, I'm not even sure, 35, 36 years ago, was through a gentleman named Rocco Erico. Okay. Rocco is a por- protege of a man named George Lamsa. Lamsa did a translation back in the geez, 40s, I guess, maybe 50s. I'm not even sure of the time frame. And he made, uh, when, when the text came out, unfortunately, the Lamsa Bible is very limited. There's some great introductory material in it but it's very sparse and limited in the, in its corrections. My understanding is that he made something like 17 or 1800 corrections and he only at at the point where he was translating he was having his life threatened by so-called Christians who didn't like okay. the fact that he wasn't going going along with the King James and he said okay. that uh he should have been making somewhere between 10 and 12,000 changes. And if I remember correctly, he made about 1,700. So that's one of my sources. And Rocco and I worked together for several years. I used to bring him into my center in South Florida, and he used to have me come out to, uh, to California to his center to speak and present. And so the, the – Lam's the translation isn't that great a source because it's very limited. However, both Rocco and George Lamsa have written several books, and some of those books are gospel light, more light of the gospel, idioms of the Bible explained, Old Testament light. There's a whole series. If you can find anything by George Lamsa and Rocco Erico on the Aramaic, that will fill in. And I've found that those commentaries are far richer than the actual book itself because of the limited translations uh, or the limited changes that he made. George Lamsa was born in a native 
Aramaic speaking family. So he was, he didn't have to unlearn what the Greeks had brainwashed him with, but he knew these things from his own culture, his own cultural background and language. Uh, so that's one source. Another is, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Let me get, get to it. He did a translation of the Lord's Prayer, and I'm not remembering his name right now, but he's got some good good material, you know, around the idea of the Lord's Prayer and such. And then the, the rest Douglas of the Clots? Neil Douglas Klotz, yes, yes. Thank you, because his, he was his my work first on, on, introduction. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, his work on the Lord's Prayer, although he and and actually Rocco still does this and I think it is a great disservice to people, he still calls the Lord's Prayer a prayer. They both do. And it's not a prayer. In Aramaic, it's not a prayer. And I've never heard, you know, this is something that I realized personally as I worked with it, as I taught from it. And uh, I would love to get this piece of information to Rocco, but Rocco tends to be, I mean, I, he's a wonderful man, very sensitive, but tends to be rather resistant to anything new. But if you if you think about, you know, this is to me is just another piece in building our foundation uh, toward understanding more about the Aramaic. You think about the context of what people call the Lord's Prayer, and then you look at how people go directly 180 degrees against Yeshua's instructions, who says, do not repeat and repeat like the pagans. Don't do that. That's that's going to the mind. That's that's being locked in the mind. And you know the question that they asked him uh, was, and and obviously there was a lack of understanding and perhaps confusion as today. There's great confusion about the word prayer because we have this Greek idea that prayer is putting our order into the cosmic gift catalog, and yet. They didn't ask Jesus to say Yeshua to say a prayer for them. They asked him to teach them how to pray. And there's another word that's been grossly misrepresented by the Greeks. Oh, just tell, you know, put your word in the cosmic gift catalog, tell God what you want, and then you've said a prayer. Well, actually, properly labeled, properly defined, that would be a petition asking for something, a petition, doesn't say don't have one, but, but that's not prayer. They asked Yeshua, because they obviously didn't understand, to teach them, and he taught them. Now, to use an example, and, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but there are other folks listening too, so it's for everybody. But if, if um, let's say I were a voice coach and a, a, a teacher of, of singers, and you wanted to learn from me, and you said, Michael, teach me to sing, would I be teaching you to sing if I sang you a song? Obviously not. I mean, you might learn something, incidentally, from my singing a song, but I wouldn't be teaching you to sing. Yeshua didn't say a prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. Yeshua said, here's a set of instructions. Here's how. You do this thing called prayer, and the word prayer in Aramaic means more a closer to a literal meaning is to set a trap for God, which in our English language for most people is kind of a shocker. It's, well, you're going to trap God. What the heck does that mean? But when you recognize that this man, Yeshua, did not live in a perceptual mind, he didn't live in the world of appearances, he lived in the actuality of relationship with life, with his creator, and so if, if you think of and recognize, and we'll, we'll bring Einstein into it here, that we live in an energy system, basically an antenna is what has to be the right shape and it has to be oriented properly in order to capture the signal it's designed to capture. You know, if I have a, let's say we've got a, a TV station here, we'll say it's Channel 4, and I go to Buffalo, New York, and I buy an antenna for Channel 4 in Buffalo, New York. Well, the carrier wave for the TV station in Buffalo, New York, and, New York, and the carrier wave here in Bristol, Virginia, is a totally different thing. And if I bring that antenna down here and try to capture Channel 4, I'm probably going to get a snowy, lousy picture. I need an antenna that is the proper shape to capture the frequency, and I'm going to need to 
orient that properly. If I put it up on the roof and I align it, and somebody comes along in the night and turns the antenna backward, am I going to get a good signal from channel two? And you probably remember, as I do, you know, this is kind of a thing that, that's, that's gone now pretty much. Uh, kids would, wouldn't even know what you were talking about. But you probably remember when you wanted to change channels, and when you changed channels, you went over and you hit a little crank. You, I can remember having a manual crank, and then I can remember having an electric crank that literally turned the antenna, and you tuned the antenna. You oriented it so you got a good signal. Do you remember doing that? No, because uh, we were backwards enough that we had to crawl up on the roof to do it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't well, ever remember. Was a little... <laughs> I don't ever remember a crank. And we okay. never had a crank. You were one up on well, it. <laughs> well, I, I can I can remember the, the 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 day my dad took this motor and you know put it on the pipe. And the motor turned the antenna so you didn't have to physically move. But the same net result, what was it doing? It was orienting the properly shaped antenna in the right direction to get the best signal. That's what the prayer, word prayer means. You and I are custom designed by the creator to capture and reflect the presence of love into the world. And if we've been misaligned, if we've been given frequencies that are out of harmony with that, then what we need to do is to get back into alignment. And that's what what people call the Lord's Prayer. That's what it is. It's a set of instructions. And later I'm planning to get into those instructions. But that's that's what the word means. It doesn't have anything to do with, you know, tell, tell the cosmic gift catalog to bring you something. And that's interesting that you say that, Michael, because I somehow interpreted uh, Neil Douglas's clause when he talked about the divine principles and the uh, mm-hmm. the harmony, you know, the one harmony. Well, for me, the harmony right. is more of a heart issue, and the principles are more of a head in, in issue. And since you've mentioned that we are antennas ourselves and we have to align, um, I got it that the prayer, I didn't get it as a teaching tool but I got it as the prayer was telling me to align my vision with the vision of the cosmos. And I'm coming to the realization I don't have a clue about the vision of the conscious, of the cosmos other than what little bits and pieces I get. So it's kind of like, well, I know that this life force is in charge and not me, except, of course, I forget it in my daily life, right? So I have to keep reconnecting. That, and you, might want, you might want to look at that line. You might want to look at those words. Notice the assumption that somebody's fed you that, of course, I'm going to go out of alignment. That might be a good word right. for the topic. In my, in my daily life, because I catch myself being yeah. out of alignment, yeah. not because somebody's yeah. told me. But Larry will yeah. say something that I'm highly resistant to, and after I return to sanity, I'll say, well, he was right. You know, he was my feedback loop, oh. <laughs> and, 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 and not always, you know, but enough to know that I'm constantly realigning my antenna, and I also include the body in that mm-hmm. antenna. I wanted to share that with you. So insight, inspiration, and intuition all have to be lined up as well in yeah. my perception at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And if, if you ever get to do an intensive where it's an in-person intensive, we'll actually, uh, there's a piece of work in the intensive, uh, at least the nine-day wire, the teacher's training, there's a hands-on energy field work process, work process that we teach that literally I designed for physiologically aligning your antenna. You're, you have an antenna. The structure of your bones is not to hold your body up. Your muscles do that. The structure of your bones, like the line, the arms on the antenna and the standard in the antenna, that's what is designed to capture the frequencies we're designed for. And, you know, the, the kid that gets the cuff in the head, year after year, day after day, gets bashed around, the antenna literally is physiologically misaligned, 
and until we bring that back into alignment, and that's part and parcel of the energy field work for getting this antenna back to its proper orientation, back into its proper range of motion, because it's a, literally a self-adjusting antenna that is in continuous motion every minute that we're alive. And if something interferes with that motion, it loses its its patterned way of moving and tends to get stuck. And so the energy field work is about getting it unstuck, getting the whole, literally the physiological device back into a property aligned state so that it brings the frequencies in that it's designed to. And well, the so-called our... Lord's Prayer is an instruction set for, for aligning our minds and emotions with that. Right. And I just realized that our whole cultural sedentary lifestyle and over-focus on computer work and stuff like that is also on how we lose our alignment with just our anatomy from youth to old age and become a question mark, basically, except we don't even know it's a question mark in our, in our structure. Structure is important. It's literally the core antenna that allows us to, to, and if it's moving through its proper range of motion, you know, people think when the baby's soft spot hardens, the head is fixed, but actually if you get really tuned in and hold that baby's head or you hold an adult's head, you'll notice that there's this very subtle, slight movement. It's just a millimeter or two, like very tiny bit of motion, and that's the self-adjusting antenna. And, you know, the shape of an antenna determines the frequencies it receives. If I have the perfect antenna on the roof for channel four here, and it's perfectly aligned, and somebody goes up and bends all the arms on the antenna, I'm not going to get a very good signal. Right. The structure of the head, the spine, the pelvis, and the bones. I mean, right now, your arms, your hips are continuously moving just a millimeter or two in a semicircular motion in and out. And in when you're at the stage they call extension, which means you're in its, and I'm not sure why they use this language, it seems to me it would be the opposite, but it's called extension when your antenna is at its most constricted state. That's one shape. And then when you do what's called flexion, where it moves that millimeter or two in your whole structures in a totally, completely different state that, you know, the average person never even notices, but it's a different state. It's literally a totally, completely different antenna. It's night and day. And the every millimeter, every fraction of a millimeter between is a different frequency receiver and if we are in that proper range of motion and activity then we bring in a full rich possibility parcel to me of that underlying neural structure that was being talked about in the Beatitudes getting it all back into shape very good thank you I'm just hoping awesome young lady you- I hope that um, what I would ask, if it's possible, is if you could give every possible uh, reference to Lamsa and um, the other gentleman's name, which just slipped out. Rocco Erico. Rocco Erico, thank you. Yeah. Um, No. We're we're going to be referring to the Kaboras. That's that's pretty much going to be it. I. I mean, this is stuff I've been doing with Rocco and uh, and um, Lamsa for decades, so I don't have references for all of that. No, I no, won't be doing that. No. Uh, so, oh, you don't but, have references? No. Okay. So I, I'll just. I'm not. I'm not reading this from a book. I, I'm not. I'm no, not I reading this that. from a book or from notes. It's just part of the presentation that we're going to be doing. So, do I remember I when Rocco Erico said this or that? And can I give that reference? No, or when when Lamsa did, or when the work we did uh, in the uh, social service agencies in Albany, Georgia. This was the live doing the work live between myself and a gentleman named Dan McDougall, who was my partner at that point. So. We'll be drawing on all of that over the last four plus decades. Perfect. Perfect. And um, I have something to say about 
beliefs, but I'll wait for another show. Something. All right, young lady. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Blessings. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So a couple of other uh, references that are uh, ridiculous translations in the Greek. And then when you hear the Aramaic, it's just, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. So, And, I, and I'm going to catch a couple of them before we close. We've just got a few minutes. So I'm going to go to Job 12.6, which the Greeks tell us, and, and this is, I mean, when you think about it, it's so bizarre. The Greeks tell us, quote, the tabernacles of robbers prosper. And they that provoke God are secure and into whose hands God bring it abundantly. So basically what Job, according to the Greeks, is saying, if you're a robber, God's on your side. Provoke God and you're going to have abundance. I mean, it's just silly on its face. And to me, again, this is another way to prove the primacy of the Aramaic. So let's listen to what the Aramaic says. The Aramaic says, the tents of robbers shall perish, and the assurance of those who incite God, they will perish also because there is no God in their hearts. There is no love in their hearts. So you can easily tell which one is accurate there. Surely nobody believes that the Creator is going to be there to prosper robbers and bring abundance to them. In Aramaic, the tents of robbers shall perish and the assurance of those who incite the Creator will perish also because there is no love in their hearts. And then Job 31.10, uh, basically the conversation that precedes this particular passage, Job is talking about, you know, he's been accused of things, of, of, of wrongdoing. And so he's saying, well, if they have now, so here's the Greek translation, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. In other words, if I've cheated, take my wife and do it with her what you will. There's a, 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 an, another similar Greek-oriented translation that says, let my wife be in another man's abode and let others have relationships with her. In other words, if I've cheated, turn my wife into a sex object. No. This is a patriarch? No, come on. Are you serious? In Aramaic, what does it say? Then let my wife grind meal for others and let her bake bread in another man's place. In other words, she's going to have to go and earn a living elsewhere. And put a hold on it there because we're down. The show just warned me we're down to the last minute. So I'm going to say thank you for joining us. I hope this is a been a, a good foundation point for you and serves well. If it has brings questions for you, please make note of the questions. Let's bring them up in the show tomorrow. Thanks for being with us and blessings. Take care. Bye-bye.